Chapter twenty seven of the Lamplighter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter twenty seven. I see her, her hair in ringlets fluttering free, and her lips that move with melody. Not she. There's a beauty that lovelier glows, though her coral lip with melody flows. I see her, tis she of the ivory brow, and heaven tinged orbs. I know her now. Not she. There's another, more lovely still, with a chastened mind and a tempered will. Carolyn Gilman. Mr. Graham's country house boasted a fine, old fashioned entry, with a door at either end, both of which usually stood open during the warm weather, admitting a cool current of air, and rendering the neighborhood of the front entrance a favorite resort for the family, especially during the early hours of the day, when the warm sun had no access to the spot and the shady yard, which sloped gradually down to the road, was refreshing and grateful to the sight. Here, on a pleasant June morning, Isabel Clinton and her cousin Kitty Ray had made themselves comfortable, each according to her own idea of what constituted comfort. Isabel had drawn a large armchair close to the door-sill, ensconced herself in it, and, although she held in her hand a piece of worsted work, was gazing idly down the road. She was a beautiful girl tall and finely formed, with a delicate complexion, clear blue eyes, and rich, light, flowing curls. The same lovely child, whom Gertrude had gazed upon with rapture, as leaning against the window of her father's house, she watched old True while he lit his lamp, had ripened into an equally lovely woman. Her uncommon beauty aided and enhanced by all the advantages of dress which skill could suggest or money provide, she was universally admired, flattered, and caressed. At an early age deprived of her mother, and left for some years almost wholly to the care of servants, she soon learned to appreciate, at more than their true value, the outward attractions she possessed. And her aunt, under whose tutelage she had been since she left school, was little calculated to counteract in her this undue self-admiration. An appearance of conscious superiority which distinguished her, and the independent air with which she tapped against the doorstep with her little foot, might be safely attributed, then, to her conviction that Belle Clinton, the beauty and the heiress, was looking vastly well, as she sat there, attired in a blue cashmere morning-dress, richly embroidered, and flowing open in front, for the purpose of displaying an equally rich flounced cambric petticoat. It can scarcely be wondered at that she was herself pleased and satisfied with an outward appearance that could not fail to please and satisfy the most severe critic. On a low step at her feet sat Kitty Ray, a complete contrast to her cousin, in looks, manners, and many points of character. Kitty was one of those whom the world usually calls a sweet little creature, lively, playful, and affectionate. She was so small that her childish manners became her, so full of spirits that her occasional rudeness claimed pardon on that score, too thoughtless to be always amiable or always wise and for all other faults her warm-heartedness and generous enthusiasm must plead an excuse to one who wished or even endeavoured to love her as she wished and expected to be loved by everybody she was a pretty girl always bright and animated mirthful and happy fond of her cousin belle and sometimes influenced by her though often on the other hand enlisting with all her force on the opposite side of some contested question unlike belle she was seldom well dressed for though possessed of ample means, she was very careless. On the present occasion, her dark silk wrapper was half concealed by a crimson flannel sack, which she held tightly around her, declaring it was a dreadful chilly morning, and she was half frozen to death. She certainly would go and warm herself at the kitchen fire, if she were not afraid of encountering that she-dragon, Mrs. Ellis. She was sure she did not see, if they must sit in the doorway, why Belle couldn't come to the side door, where the sun shone beautifully. "'Oh, I forgot, though,' added she, "'complexion.' "'Complexion,' said Belle, "'I'm no more afraid of hurting my complexion than you are. "'I'm sure I never freckle, or tan, either. "'I know that, but you burn all up, and look a fright. "'Well, if I didn't, I shouldn't go there to sit. "'I like to be at the front of the house, where I can see the passing. "'I wonder who those people are, coming up the road. "'I've been watching them for some time.' "'Kitty stood up, and looked in the direction to which Belle pointed.' After observing the couple who were approaching for a minute or two, she exclaimed, "'Why, that's Gertrude Flint. I wonder where she's been. 
and who can that be with her? I didn't know there was a bow to be had about here. Bow, said Bell, sneeringly. And why not a bow, cousin Bell? I'm sure he looks like one. I wouldn't give much for any of her bow, said Bell. Wouldn't you, said Kitty. You'd better wait until you see who they are. You nearsighted people shouldn't decide in such a hurry. I can tell you that he is a gentleman you wouldn't object to be walking with yourself. It's Mr. Bruce, the one we met in New Orleans. I don't believe it, exclaimed Bell, starting up. You will soon have a chance to see for yourself, for he is coming home with her. He is? What can he be walking with her for? To show his taste, perhaps. I am sure he could not find more agreeable company. You and I don't agree about that, replied Bell. I don't see anything very agreeable about her. Because you are determined not to, Bell. Everybody else thinks her charming, and Mr. Bruce is opening the gate for her as politely as if she were a queen. I like him for that. Do see, said Bell. She's got on that white cape bonnet of hers, and that checked gingham dress. I wonder what Mr. Bruce thinks of her, and he's such a critic in regard to ladies' dress. Gertrude and her companion now drew near the house. The former looked up, saw the young ladies in the doorway, and smiled pleasantly at Kitty, who was making strange grimaces, and giving significant glances over Belle's shoulder. But Mr. Bruce, who seemed much engaged by the society he was already enjoying, did not observe either of them. And they distinctly heard him say, as he handed Gertrude a small parcel he had been carrying for her, I believe I won't come in. It's such a bore to have to talk to strangers. Do you work in the garden mornings this summer? No, replied Gertrude. There is nothing left of my garden but the memory of it. Why, Miss Gertrude, said the young man, I hope these newcomers haven't interfered with. Here, observing the direction of Gertrude's eyes, he raised his own, saw Belle and Kitty standing opposite to him, and compelled now to recognize and speak with them, went forward to shake hands, trusting to his remarks about strangers in general, and these newcomers in particular. Not having been overheard. Although overheard, the young ladies chose to take no notice of that which they supposed intended for unknown individuals. They were mistaken, however. Mr. Bruce knew perfectly well that the nieces of the present Mrs. Graham were the same girls whom he had met at the South, and was, nevertheless, indifferent about renewing his acquaintance. His vanity, however, was not proof against the evident pleasure they both manifested at seeing him again. And he was in a few minutes engaged in an animated conversation with them, while Gertrude quietly entered the house and went upstairs unnoticed. She saw Emily's room, to which she had always free access, and was giving an account of her morning's expedition to the village, and the successful manner in which she had accomplished various commissions and errands. When Mrs. Ellis put her head in at the door, and said, with a most distressed voice and countenance, Hasn't Gertrude? Oh, there you are. Do tell me what Mrs. Wilkins said about the strawberries. I engaged three quarts. Hasn't she sent them? No, but I'm thankful to hear they're coming. I have been so plagued about the dinner. She now came in, shut the door, and seating herself, exclaimed, with something like a groan, I declare, Emily, such an ironing as our girls have got to do today. You never saw anything like it. There's no end to the fine clothes Mrs. Graham and those nieces of hers put into our wash. I declare it's a shame. Rich as they are, they might put out their washing. I've been helping myself as much as I could. But as Mrs. Prime says, one can't do everything at once. And I've had to see the butcher, make puddings and blancmange, and been worried to death all the time because I had forgotten to engage those strawberries. So Mrs. Wilkins hadn't sent her fruit to market when you got there? No, but she was in a great hurry getting it ready. It would have been gone in a very short time. Well, that was lucky. I don't know what I should have done without the berries, for I've no time to hunt up anything else for dessert. I've got just as much as I can do till dinner time. Mrs. Graham never kept house before, and don't know how to make allowances for anything. She comes home from Boston, expects to find everything in apple pie order, and never asks or cares who does the work. Mrs. Prime's voice was now heard, calling at the back staircase. Mrs. Ellis! Miss Wilkins' boy has fetched your strawberries, and the holes ain't off of one of em. He says they hadn't no time. That's too bad, exclaimed the tired, worried housekeeper. Who's going to take the hulls off, I should like to know? Katie is busy enough, and I'm sure I can't do it. I will, Mrs. Ellis. Let me do it, said Gertrude, following Mrs. Ellis, who was now halfway down the stairs. No, no, don't you touch to, Miss Gertrude, said Mrs. Prime. They'll only stain your fingers all up. 
No matter if they do. My hands are not made of white kid. They'll bear washing. Mrs. Ellis was only too thankful for Gertrude's help, and seating herself in the dining room, she commenced the task. In the meanwhile, Belle and Kitty were doing their best to entertain Mr. Bruce, who, sitting on the doorsteps and leaning back against a pillar of the piazza, from time to time cast his eyes down the entry and up the staircase in hopes of Gertrude's reappearance, and despairing of it at last, he was on the point of taking his departure when his sister Fanny came in at the gate and running up to the house. Was rushing past the assembled trio and into the house. Her brother, however, stretched out his arm, caught her, and before he let her go, whispered something in her ear. Who is that wild Indian? asked Kitty Ray, as Fanny ran across the entry and disappeared. A sister of mine, answered Ben, in a nonchalant manner. Why, is she? inquired Kitty, with interest. I have seen her here several times, and never took any notice of her. I didn't know she was your sister. What a pretty girl she is! Do you think so? said Ben. Sorry, I can't agree with you. I think she's a fright. Fanny now reappeared, and stopping a moment on her way upstairs, called out, without any ceremony, She says she can't come, she's busy. Who? asked Kitty, in her turn catching Fanny and detaining her. Miss Flint. Mr. Bruce colored slightly, and Bell Clinton observed it. What is she doing? inquired Kitty. Hulling strawberries. Where are you going, Fanny? asked her brother. Upstairs. Do they let you go all over the house? Miss Flint said I might go up and bring down the birds. What birds? Her birds. I'm going to hang them in the sun, and then they'll sing beautifully. She ran off, and soon came back again with a cage in her hand, containing the little monias, sent by Willie from Calcutta. There, Kitty, cried Bell. I think those are the birds that wake us up so early every morning with their noise. Very likely, said Kitty. Bring them here, will you, Fanny? I want to see them. Goodness, continued she, what little creatures they are. Do look at them, Mr. Bruce. They are so pretty. Put them down on the doorstep, Fanny, said Ben, so that we can see them better. I'm afraid you'll frighten them, replied Fanny. Miss Gertrude doesn't like to have them frightened. No, we won't, said Ben. We are disposed to be very friendly to Miss Gertrude's birds. Where did she get them? Do you know, Fanny? Why, they are India birds. Mr. Sullivan sent them to her. Who is he? Oh, he is a very particular friend. She has letters from him every little while. What, Mr. Sullivan? asked Bell. Do you know his Christian name? I suppose it's William, said Fanny. Miss Emily always calls the birds little willies. Bell! exclaimed Kitty. That's your William Sullivan. What a favored man he seems to be, said Mr. Bruce, in a tone of sarcasm. The property of one beautiful lady, and the particular friend of another. I don't know what you mean, Kitty, said Bell tartly. Mr. Sullivan is a junior partner of my father's, but I have not seen him for years. Except in your dreams, Bell, suggested Kitty. You forget. Bell now looked angry. Do you dream about Mr. Sullivan? asked Fanny, fixing her eyes on Bell as she spoke. I mean to go and ask Miss Gertrude if she does. Do, said Kitty. I'll go with you. They ran across the entry, opened the door into the dining room, and both put the question to her at the same moment. Taken thus by surprise, Gertrude neither blushed nor looked confused, but answered quietly, Yes, sometimes. But what do you, either of you, know of Mr. Sullivan? Why do you ask? Oh, nothing, answered Kitty. Only some others do, and we are inquiring round to see how many there are. And she shut the door and ran back in triumph to tell Bell she might as well be frank, like Gertrude, and plead guilty to the weakness. It looked so much better than blushing and denying it. But it would not do to joke with Bell any longer. She was seriously offended and took no pains to conceal the fact. Mr. Bruce felt awkward and annoyed and soon went away, leaving the two cousins to settle their difficulty as they best could. As soon as he had gone, Bell folded up her work and walked upstairs to her room with great dignity, while Kitty stayed behind to laugh over the matter and improve her opportunity to make friends with Fanny Bruce, for Kitty was not a little interested in the brother and labored under the common but often mistaken idea that in cultivating the acquaintance of the sister she should advance her cause. Perhaps she was somewhat induced to this step by her having observed that Gertrude appeared to be an equal favorite with both. She therefore called Fanny to sit beside her. Put her arm round her waist and commenced talking about Gertrude, 
and the origin and extent of the intimacy which seemed to exist between her and the Bruce family. Fanny, who was always communicative, willingly informed her of the circumstances which had attached her so strongly to a friend, who was some years her senior. "'And your brother,' said Kitty, "'he has known her some time, hasn't he?' "'Yes, indeed, I suppose so,' answered Fanny, carelessly. "'Does he like her?' "'I don't know. I should think he would. I don't see how he can help it.' "'What did he whisper to you when you came up the steps?' Fanny could not remember at once, but on being reminded of the answer she had given, she replied promptly, "'Oh, he bade me ask Miss Gertrude if she wasn't coming back to see him again, and tell her he was tired to death waiting for her.' Kitty pouted and looked vexed. "'I want to know,' said she, "'if Miss Flint has been in the habit of receiving company here, and being treated like an equal.' "'Of course she has,' answered Fanny, with spirit. "'Why shouldn't she? She's the most perfect lady I ever saw, and Mother says she has beautiful manners, and I must take pattern by her.' "'Oh, Miss Gertrude!' called she, as Gertrude, who had been to place the strawberries in the refrigerator, crossed the back part of the long entry. "'Are you ready now?' "'Yes, Fanny, I shall be in a moment,' answered Gertrude. "'Ready for what?' inquired Kitty. "'To read,' said Fanny. "'She is going to read the rest of Hamlet to Miss Emily. She read the first three acts yesterday, and Miss Emily let me sit in her room and hear it. I can't understand it when I read it myself, but when I listen to Miss Gertrude it seems quite plain.' She's a splendid reader, and I came in to-day on purpose to hear the play finished. Kitty's last companion having deserted her, she stretched herself on the entry sofa and fell asleep. She was wakened by her aunt, who returned from the city a short time before dinner, and finding her asleep in her morning wrapper, shook her by the arm, and said, in a voice which the best intentions could never render otherwise than loud and coarse, "'Kitty Ray, wake up and go dress for dinner.' I saw Belle at the chamber window looking like a beauty. I wish you'd take half the pains she does to improve your appearance. Kitty yawned, and after delaying as long as she chose, finally followed Mrs. Graham's directions. It was Kitty's policy, after giving offense to her cousin Belle, to appear utterly unconscious of the existence of any unkind feelings. And though Belle often manifested some degree of sulkiness, she was too dependent upon Kitty's society to retain that disposition long. They were soon, therefore, chatting together as usual. Bell said Kitty, as she stood arranging her hair at the glass, "'Do you remember a girl we used to meet every morning, on her way to school, walking with a paralytic old man?' "'Yes.' "'Do you know, I think it was Gertrude Flint. She has altered very much, to be sure, but the features are still the same, and there certainly never was but one such pair of eyes.' "'I have no doubt she is the same person,' said Bell composedly. "'Did you think of it before?' "'Yes, as soon as Fanny spoke of her knowing Willie Sullivan. "'Why, Belle, why didn't you speak of it?' "'Lor, Kitty, I don't feel so much interest in her as you and some others do.' "'What others?' "'It was now Belle's turn to be provoking. "'Why, Mr. Bruce, don't you see he is half in love with her?' "'No, I don't see any such thing. "'He has known her for a long time. "'Fanny says so. "'And, of course, he feels a regard and respect for a girl "'that the Grams make so much account of.' "'But I don't believe he'd think of such a thing "'as being in love with a poor girl like her, "'with no family connections to boast of. "'Perhaps he didn't think of being. "'Well, he wouldn't be. "'She isn't the sort of person that would suit him. "'He has been in society a great deal, "'not only at home, but in Paris, "'and he would want a wife that was very lively "'and fond of company, "'and knew how to make a show with money. "'A girl, for instance, like Kitty Ray. "'How ridiculous, Belle, just as if people couldn't talk without thinking of themselves all the time. "'What do I care about Ben Bruce?' "'I don't know that you care anything about him, "'but I wouldn't pull all the hair out of my head about it, as you seem to be doing. "'There's the dinner, Belle, and you'll be late, as usual.'" End of chapter 27